five and three, two, one, and hey, I'm live. Thanks for checking out my video. Uh, this one I wanted to talk about the uh, digital clock that I've created for my personal side project. Uh, I, I like to call it an accurate digital clock with uh, some multi-threading thrown in there and some other cool features, uh, NTP time synchronization, uh, sheep. Uh, you'll see there's a little Easter egg sheep thing that we can check out and yeah, I just I wanted to I saw some videos online recently about like JavaScript clocks for some reason. I don't know if that's become popular, mostly analog clocks and mostly just about the visuals of them, uh, often doing like rotate uh, on CSS, which is kind of a clever way to do it. Uh, but I wanted to focus more on like an analog or digital clock, sorry, just to focus more on the actual accuracy of the time and different ways that you can do that and different ways you can render a clock on a browser and just the way that I'm doing it for my project. Uh, so let's go over the features and just dive into some code. Uh, and yeah, the first feature, I have some notes here that we can kind of go over. The first big feature is that it runs in a web worker. And uh, what does that mean exactly? So here's the page right here. You can see the clock here at the bottom and the time is uh, 10, 29 and 11 seconds, 12 seconds, 13 seconds. Um, that's one thing that I wanted to note with my clock is that I, I like to have a seconds hand. I think the analog clock demo that I saw also had a seconds hand, but I think it's nice to have in a digital clock. Uh, I turn it on in my default windows as well and uh, recommend it for everybody if people that like to be a little bit accurate about when they when to expect the next minute to occur kind of thing. I guess that's why I like it. Uh, and if you see here when I right click, we also have a, a local time and a server time option. We'll get into what that means in a moment. Uh, but yeah, just to start off, let's go with this web worker concept here. So I got DevTools open. And if we go into the sources here, you can actually, uh, where is it here? Let me move up here this piece and you can see in the threads section here that there's the the main thread that we'll go over what that is and then there's also the this clock thread basically which is where the web worker is running so the clock itself and the code for the clock is running on a separate thread that's kind of where the multi-threading comes in which is why it's the the main title here and i wanted to mention it right at the start uh getting into what web workers are uh, that's, I always go back to these MDN articles because they're very clear as to uh, there's some some of the best documentation for browser information I find. Web workers are a simple means for web content to run scripts in background threads. So that's the basic of it. There, it's uh, the worker thread can perform tasks without interfering with the user interface. And when I talk about the user in interface and that main thread, the, again we have an MDN article for that. The main threads where the browser processes user events and paints. Uh, by default, the browser uses a single thread to run all JavaScript in your page as well as perform layout reflow and garbage collection. This means long running tasks can block the main thread. Now this is a key piece of why I wanted to put on a web worker. And some may argue it's a little silly, but but one aspect is that if, if while I'm doing things on my website, if it were to freeze the main thread to the point where I wouldn't be able to move this, I wouldn't be able to make these right click menus, two things would still keep moving. One would be the wallpaper background, the waves would keep moving because that's on a worker thread and the other would be this clock now. That's something, for some reason I thought it would be kind of neat. If anything, it's probably disorienting to a user to have the page freeze but still see the clock moving. So they go, why is it, it's not working? It must not be frozen, the clock's moving. Um, and doing this required a few other things because it's not as simple as just getting it into a web worker because you can move it into a web worker and then you can do the the basic calculation of taking whatever time it is now turning that into a formatted string and then sending that to the main thread to be painted that is the way that i had started with when i did it but if you want it to be where the main thread can be completely locked and you still see the clock change then you kind of have to stop using the dom and stop using react and don't rely on it actually updating text in the document object model here. That's why that I moved to another piece, uh, another aspect to this, which is called the off-screen canvas. And that is this piece here. And the off-screen canvas interface provides a canvas that can be rendered off-screen. And it's available in uh, uh, Worker and Window. Yeah, you can you can use it in Window, but, work, but moving it into a Worker is where it gets its real power, basically. So by doing that, I'm able to actually draw the clock itself, this picture, uh, in the worker thread, and then update that. And it's essentially connected to the DOM, but it's not connected to the main thread in a certain way. And you can see here that it's just a canvas element. It's, there's no actual text there. And that is one piece where you, you lose the ability to, say, copy it. I don't want people to be able to copy the clock. I'm fine for it to be like a fixture, like a picture almost. But it's something to be aware of that you lose that. 
And I do have a fallback because off screen canvas actually doesn't have as good a support as web workers. So I'm okay with web workers. Basically, I'm going to say, hey, you're going to need web workers to, to see this, but you don't need off, off screen canvas. If at the end of the day, you don't have off screen canvas, it will print the text to the DOM. And if the main thread does lock, it will actually, you won't see the clock change, but it will still be sending those updates. It's just that React will be frozen to be able to show them to the user. But with this uh, off-screen canvas, that's not the case. And you can see here web workers have pretty good support. But if you look at the off-screen canvas uh, MDN article here, you go to the bottom, you can see that the support is a little more spotty. Pretty much no for Safari. Um, I think Firefox, yes. Possibly behind a flag, though. I don't think it's... It might not normally work. Uh, I've just assumed it's basically Chrome, which is, is around 60 70% of most browsers you're going to run into, perhaps even more. So I'm happy with that for now, and hopefully in the future other browsers will support that because it's a cool feature. Uh, like I said, I use it for the wallpaper as well. But again, I have a fallback where if you don't support off-screen canvas, it'll just do it the traditional way, um, which is, but still within a worker. In the case of the wallpaper, it can't do that in the worker then because it actually has to draw a real canvas. So, uh, but in the case of the clock, it can just send the text, and then the text can be handled with React. And, and that's where we'll get into the code here, by the way. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of discuss some of that feature. Let's actually jump into the code on that note too now, now that we've discussed kind of what that piece is. So the worker and the off-screen canvas. Let's go to the code here. Uh, in my components, in the system components, I've called it, the taskbar, the clock, here it is. So the clock consists of several files, the main one being the index file here. And I've kind of uh, shrunk this here. If you do control K0 in VS Code, it'll shrink all the all the little plus symbols into mi minuses basically so you can expand them all and now we can kind of see so this is the main component here the clock here's the export for it uh, as i said there's this sheep easter egg that we'll get into that's this little piece here i didn't really have anywhere better to put this but i could have put this somewhere in a different module fo folder like i have a functions file as you can see here that i imported a type from i probably could have moved that there uh, and these are just some variables that are declared above the function uh, specifically the source map this is where I said it can be basically the local source is the if you run in JavaScript new date essentially in a browser the that date that you're getting is from that the client browser that's a local source the other source being the server source that is where we're, I'm using a, another server called an NTP server that actually uh, is provided for free and synchronizes with several different NTP servers that are synchronized through atomic clocks and use different algorithms to kind of try to triangulate triangulate is not the right word but try to agree upon a, a synchronized time and i use a bit of that algorithm that comes from the ntp.js script to uh also synchronize if you pick that option so going back to what i had here when i sued server time if you see right here so it's 10 36 08 9 and if we switch it to server time we'll see i'm not sure how well synced my clock is but it might perhaps change by a second let's see 16 17 pretty much no my, my local clock is actually pretty synchronized, but you could try this for yourself. Go to dustinbrett.com and switch over to server versus local time, and you might see a larger deviation in time. And if you do, then perhaps your local clock is not as synchronized. Uh, and as you can see, when I switched over to server time, if we let's clear the network here and do it again, switch back to server time, you'll see the request comes in um, right here. Let me open that request and get a little more information from it. So the headers here, this is where I'm using that NTPJS uh, server that they provide and I have a link to some information about it. It's, it's just a cool service that's offered ntp.js correct time for your web apps uh, They suggest a script here. I kind of looked at the script and uh, Destructed it a little bit. It's a pretty simple script, but it has a few pieces that it handles with this this payload that they send where they send a uh, Now which has a timestamp Back off time, which is so you're not constantly like flooding it asking give me the time give me the time uh, and also, I believe it, it can kind of, there, there can be another piece that's added here if you flood it, where it's like, whoa, whoa, hold off. Uh, and then also there's a server piece that's completely irrelevant. But the now and the back off, that's the kind of stuff that's in their script. And I took this and ran it through like a JavaScript beautifier to kind of get a little more clarity on what was going on. But there wasn't much to it. And, and that's what I've kind of uh, done in the script that I'll show here. So you can see a request comes in. It's got those that information, the back off and the now. And then you can I use that to essentially synchronize when I am generating the time versus taking a timestamp locally and just trusting that 
I take this, I take like timestamp plus adjusted MTP response to get whatever the, the new timestamp will be. Switch back to local for now. And, and that'll just uh, keep updating on a, a reasonable time that matched what their script was allowing. I tried to stick to their script. And, and they have some interesting information. It's, an, it's a free server. It's based on quite a few different uh, NTP servers. You're trusting their time, but I, I'm not really trusting them to mess with the time server. That doesn't seem like a thing worth messing with. At worst, they could kind of make the server version out of sync. I don't see any kind of hacks coming from that based on how I take the interpretation of their JSON data. Um, so yeah, I'm trusting their server there, but that's that's a cool little service that I have there that I found and I thought, hey, let's use that. Another thing that I'm doing to synchronize it, actually, we'll get to that in a second. That's one of the things I think on my list here. Uh, yes, getting into the more specifics about system syncing, but let's go a bit more into the code here because um, I deviated get talking about this piece of it here. Let's dive into the code here now. This is the main function. Essentially, it's a functional component in React, so it's just a, it's a little mixture of HTML and JavaScript kind of put together. Uh, as far as the CSS piece of it, I'm using what's called styled components. So here's the return data from that function, and it's wrapped in the styled component. The styled component is right here, and essentially that's where the CSS goes. So in this case, I have some pretty simple CSS. I mean, as you saw from the clock, there's, there's nothing too uh, fancy going on here. The bottom right is the clock. It's basically just white text. Uh, on a transparent background uh, at some specific height and width. Not really relevant what, what they are. But that's that's really all that I'm doing here in the configuration. I set a min and max width so it doesn't really, it can't really adjust too much. Some padding, I make sure it's centered, position where I want it, some coloring when you hover. Nothing fancy there, so that's the styling. And then beyond the styling, so that's a div. Although Also, by the way, the styled components, the way they work here, it says here it's just a div. So it just creates a div on the, on the in the DOM. So on the div here within React, we have these ref elements that will give us the actual reference to the that element, so that we can use it within our within the React code. Uh, I take that reference, that div, and and that's when I'm that's where I'm going to put the canvas essentially. And that only uh, I mean the only thing I'm using this ref for is in the scenario where I use the off-screen canvas. So you see here I have this big opening condition. That's that, that basically requires the support of the off-screen canvas. And if that doesn't occur, then this essentially won't do anything relevant. And then in the inside the div will just be the text. So you see here, if, if it doesn't support the canvas, it'll just do the time. That, that's just the text. Otherwise, it won't put anything in here because the canvas is going to be injected by this logic here um, that I've, deci I've decided to use. So I checked that it supports Canvas, and it supports Canvas is very simple. I just make sure there's a window object, and that window has window dot off screen Canvas. If it has that, it essentially supports off screen Canvas, is what I'm saying at least. Um, now, some as code goes, there's solutions that you're like, do I need this anymore? I'm not sure, but I don't want to mess with it. That's this first line here. So basically, I go into that container element here, the clock container, and if there is anything in it, any, uh, then I just delete it. I don't know what would be in it, but I think at some point in my testing, this was causing me an issue. Either text was getting put in there or an, an old canvas after refresh. So basically, whenever the ref gets created, if it's going to put a canvas in there, it makes sure there's nothing in there. And the way that I've decided to do that is basically just iterating over the children and saying, for each element, just remove them. Um, but I, ca I can't argue for this. I don't know why exactly that was necessary, but I can tell you that at one point I felt it was. So let's ignore that line. The relevant line here is where I, I take a ref, a uh, React ref, essentially. To, so for the life cycle of this React component, the clock component, I'm also setting up an, a reference to the off-screen clock canvas. And I have a function here that creates the off-screen canvas by taking that container that we got, the pixel ratio. That's actually important. It took me a while to figure that out. This is a canvas thing that's worth discussing. And then also the clock size. And the clock size is just a generic... Um, value that I've decided on that's very specific to that container. It's our, it's basically what is it, like 30 height by 66 width. And that's just static. I've, I've got it as constants here because I'm also using it, I believe, in a few other places in the styling. Like the taskbar height is very generic. I think base clock I might just only be using here, but I'm a fan of constants over comments sometimes. So that's why I'm, I have constants in this case. Let's dive into create off-screen canvas because it's very simple. So we can just quickly peek at it. So there, this is it here. There's not too much to it. Basically, it just creates a, a 
element canvas. We all know about canvases, I guess, in the same way that we know what a div is. It's just an element. Uh, ha happens to have some aspects to it. Um, it's important with these off-screen canvases that the height is specified, both heights, the styled height as well as the actual height on the element itself. But they are different. The styled height is the height that you just want it to be uh, the basic height, like I said, 66 by 30. But then there's also the canvas height that's going to be more applicable to this pixel ratio. And pixel ratio is something I didn't notice until I started messing more with mobile with this. For example, my S21 phone, the pixel ratio there is like three to uh, three to one, I think, I think or something. Or not, th I don't know if three to one is the right way to say it, but it's three X. So I need to make a canvas that's essentially three times bigger to show at the same size without it looking blurry and all messed up on my phone. And that's where I just make sure to get this device pixel ratio. This is something you get right from the window object, window.devicepixelRatio. Uh, it's, sim it's simple to show you. I can just do window.devicepixelRatio. As you see here in most browsers, it's going to be a 1, I think, if you're on your desktop. I think if you zoom in, actually, this changes as well. And that's actually something that I've, I've made... Uh, some code to make sure that it it has to redo the canvas every time that the pixel ratio changes dynamically Which typically isn't something that happens, but I realized that zooming can make it happen So I've decided to just make some code to handle that Anyways, like I said you create a canvas you set its height and width in a few ways And then you just append it to that container element and then the key piece here that you need to hold on to is this within the canvas there's a function called Transfer control to off screen. That gives you the off screen canvas. That's the thing that you can pass to the worker and say, here, you can draw to this. And whatever you draw to that, it's going to go to the to the browser, essentially, and be overlaid wherever it is you've decided to put it. So that's what I get here that I use as that reference. And then I pass that along to the worker in a post message here. And I'll show you how I make the worker as well. It's actually not super hard. Um, there is a piece to it that's kind of custom for me and that I have a hook that I've used where I pass in a worker and a function, but it's 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 just some simple glue. Um, and if you look up workers here in the using web workers, it's actually not too hard to make a web worker. It basically is as simple as this new worker and you just put it at a JavaScript file that just has code that doesn't look like it's worker related code necessarily, depending on, on what kind of things you reference in it. In my case, there is some worker specific stuff to it. But basically, yeah, so the way workers communicate is you post messages to them. So at this point, it's assumed that this already has the worker here, and I post a message to it of, here's that off-screen canvas, and here's the pixel ratio. Also, the worker doesn't know the pixel ratio. It doesn't, that's, a, that's one of the key elements, is that the worker doesn't communicate with the DOM directly. So that's where you need something like this off-screen canvas if you want to be able to do multi-threaded drawing of things to the, the screen for the user, basically. So that's all that this does here within the ref. Like I said, it creates that off-screen canvas and then sends it to the worker if it supports it. Otherwise, it's just the text. Simple enough. Uh, if Until there is time, it just re it sends nothing back. This is called the React Fragment. It's basically just saying send empty, empty HTML. Don't put anything in there. And I have two hooks here. This hook is not too relevant. Basically, whenever the clock source changes, I also... Um, Reset the canvas, essentially. Basically, just resetting it here updates the ref and kind of kicks it back in when the clock source is reset. And the clock source is, is that local versus server. Um, I can't... Again, this is one of those mystery lines where I don't remember why that's necessary. It doesn't seem like it should be necessary that depending on where the, the source of the time comes from, the drawing requires a reset. But believe me, for some reason, I believe it did at some point. Uh, I'm not the kind of person that goes in and like removes lines necessarily that are like th that are that are that glue. You know, when you got a house of cards and you have a few sticks and you go, why is there a stick in my house of cards? I'm just going to get rid of this. It's probably a bad idea most of the time, unless you really got to understand why that sticks there. And I, yeah, I only half understand that. So the only other hook here that again is similar to this ref where it's blocked behind this supporting of the off screen canvas. And if it does support off-screen canvas, it runs this where it monitors the pixel ratio. Because as I said, if you zoom in, it'll change the pixel ratio. So this is another cool little JavaScript function, window.matchmedia. And you can actually put like a, a CSS media query, basically. So in this case, resolution, and then whatever the device pixel ratio is of uh, currently, that's the... So when it deviates from that, when that changes, basically. So right now, I'm if this was to, to run the first time, it would say 1x, let's say. So it's saying the media query is resolution 1x. If that changes, I want you to trigger this. So 
it is one X, you zoom in, that changes it. This triggers the change event. And then within that change event, that's when I can once again send to the worker, say, hey, you know, the pixel ratio changed. And, and then I I also specify that, that these this um, add event listener is a very common way to add events. And within that, there's configuration options you can do. Some, some ones that I always do all the time to the point where I made a constant of them are these two here called uh, once and passive. And, and that's why I call the constant a one-time passive event. Uh, because these two fields, the once means that as soon as it triggers, it's never going to trigger again. And passive means you're not going to prevent default of the event. You're not going to stop propagation, any of that stuff, which in my case, I'm not going to do. So I just post the worker and then I run the same function again, essentially, because I know it's a one-time thing. This allows me to basically not just be flooding it or creating a bunch of listeners, that kind of thing, because I just know it's only going to run one time. And that for the most part works. That's the bulk of this. Uh, getting to the worker here, I was telling you I have that custom hook. So basically I take in that new worker piece and the function that I want to run, uh, what I call like the data function. And that's what I'm doing within this hook here is I just basically take that that an initial worker function and I pass that on as the message. And then and every time that the that any of the workers that I've scripted send the message and use this hook, I know that that's going to run that, that one function that I know about. But this is, and this also has the aspect where it cleans up the worker. It'll run the term, it'll run terminate and it'll clean the ref and stuff. Um, but if you're not using React and you want to make all of this without the React language, then you don't necessarily need to put this in a hook. And it's just a simple matter of making a, um, a worker basically, which like I said, is in that MDN article. Uh, as far as what the function is that runs, it's a simple enough function here. I only care about two things from the React side. If the worker asks me what the source is, I return the source. So the worker doesn't necessarily know up front because it change it can change. Uh, and from the front end, the, the user can say, oh, no, you know, I don't want local now. I want server. So then that can, uh, when update time is occurring, that can post a message there. And in an, any other scenario, it just gives the newest time. And time doesn't do too much here necessarily if it's doing off-screen canvas. What it'll do is it'll update the the now event. So now we'll get updated and then that will give us the date and time. And the only place we really use the date and time, uh, where do we use date even? We use it somewhere. Where is date used? Let's find it. I think it's right here. No, I'm not even sure where date's used, but I'm almost sure we use it. It'd be pretty crazy if we didn't, right? Okay, here. Oh yeah. Oh, was this hidden? Oh, this got hidden and all that. Oh, sneaky. So when you hide this, it hides the other little props here. I wanted to discuss those. So he, so within the title, the title is like the alt tag when you hover over an element. So the little tooltip that pops up, just like the Windows clock, I want to be the date. And the time, that only that's mostly just a throwaway whenever off-screen canvas is being used because we don't use it. But we do actually use it the one time to make sure that, hey, we have a time. You know, we have a time. We can continue on to this. Uh, as far as the other props... There's a few I use, one called Suppress Hydration Warning. This is a React one, just because when it does server-side rendering uh, generation, I mean, if if we don't support the canvas and we use the time in there, the time obviously changes all the time. So when hydration is comparing the unhydrated to the hydrated version or however it does it, it notices they're different because it's like, hey, why you have this text here and you have different text here? Because it doesn't know it's a time and that the seconds are changing all the time. So I just put this Suppress Hydration Warning. Um, the on click is for that Easter egg that we're about to get to. And then the aria label. Yeah, that's just like some accessibility stuff. That's because I didn't want the, the title to be confused for the label. So for accessibility reasons, we want to know that it's labeled as the clock basically. Um, got another message here just to double check here from dark max. Thanks from, th uh, by the way, this is a live stream. Feel free to throw messages and comments in. And I got one here from dark max. Are you interested in learning how to use another framework? I see you always use React. Um, yeah, I'm definitely interested. I've, I've, I've used other frameworks. I've used Vue. I've used Angular professionally for years. Um, I guess I'm, I, have a, I like React now. I'm in a React mood lately, uh, as is the industry in general. But uh, I'm, I'm interested in other ones. I'm not the kind of person that, hey, I'm just going to learn another framework for the heck of it. Or I mean, if there's something really different about it, it's like SolidJS has some pretty cool things I've seen. Um, I, can, I can consider it. But I'm just really happy with the React paradigm, I guess, the component paradigm that React is doing. So I'm, I'm even okay with 
uh, some inefficiencies perhaps in, in React 18 and their compile and their the renderers and that kind of thing. I put up with that just because I I like the the way that I'm able to write in React. Uh, but that being said, you know, I mean, a lot of what I'm doing here fits with other paradigms too, and only a few of the basic lifecycle things are you kind of have to change for, within the frameworks. But uh, thank you for the question. And uh, as soon as there's another framework that pulls me away, definitely I'll do it. I'm not going to be React, a React fanboy for the rest of my life necessarily. Uh, I've, I've definitely thought about that. Like if there's ever a version three, if, if I ever switch frameworks, that'll definitely be a reason for me to rewrite my entire side project in this new framework. But I, I'm still kind of all in on, on React just because uh, I haven't seen anything that's kind of pulled me away. There's definitely other things that have other positives, but yeah, I'm still kind of react at the moment. Um, I'm going to try to f remember what I was talking about now, as far as the other piece, I think I explained every piece of this here. Ah, the new worker piece. Yes. So that's here. Here's that piece here that we saw. So I say new worker, and then this is a little tricky web pack thing I had to do where you have to say new URL and then you just import dot meta dot URL, which is kind of weird. And then I specify where my worker is. And this is a JS file. This is kind of weird, but this is what I had to do to get it to work with Webpack. Uh, and also when you're doing a new worker, you can specify a name. Otherwise one gets picked at like a, uh, I think it's based on the file name. So I do specify like clock local, clock source, because I, I just like that. So as you see here, when we were in the browser in sources, it actually says clock local. And if I switch to the server, it'll actually change the web worker to a, a server web worker that functions differently, basically. And, I, and that's why I changed the name. That's everything for this piece without doing the Easter egg. Let's just jump into the Easter egg too, just to sneak it in before we start getting into what's going on in the worker, because there's not much else after that. Uh, so the Easter egg's a fun little thing I just decided on where if you click on the clock seven times, it will pop up a sheep because I already had a thing to make sheep happen. So I thought that's a fun Easter egg because the only other way to make it happen is for someone to open up the terminal and type e sheep or sheep now, uh, and people don't always do that. So I thought, eh, let's have another way to open up the sheep. And as far as the code here that supports it, let me just try to remember what the heck I wrote here. Target tab index. I think the logic of this is that I wanted a blur only when they click once, then I would put a blur, I would monitor that if the cursor leaves there, then they have to come back and do another seven clicks. So for that, that's why I'm doing this little dynamic adding of the tab index so that blur works in focus and also adding a mouse leave detection along with the blur, I believe. Oh yeah, because blur, because you can just click off if you're doing uh, touch. And that's how I do the detection to make sure that they stay and touch the same thing seven times and focus in the same place. And then, yeah, as far as that, you just do spawn sheep. I already had the sheep uh, as part of this e-sheep, which I'll take a peek before I uh, show you here. This is the e-sheep page just to give credit where credit's due. I didn't create the sheep, but uh, the sheep is like an, an old thing from from a long time ago, the, the or late 90s or mid 90s, like Windows 95 days. And it's something I found a while ago. And, and yeah, so it just, it just runs the sheep and then you have to do another seven clicks to get another sheep. And let's just pop up a sheep here. So I'm gonna click the clock seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and then where's the sheep? There it is and he falls from the sky. And if I just keep clicking this clock, you know, 14 times, we'll get two more sheep. 21 times, we get three sheep. And and actually, there's a one in seven chance of a penguin, I believe. There's a penguin right there. I got two of them in a row. So that's actually rare. So that's a fun thing. And I think there's actually like a one in 20 chance of getting a cat. But I, you can click a thousand times and not get the cat. Or you can get the cat pretty quick. I, always, I, mean, I think I put some logic in there. So it's always the sheep the first time. But then after that, oh, here we go. I got the cat finally. So you can also get this cat too. And you can actually move these things around. So it's kind of a fun little Easter egg. Back to the code, one other piece. Uh, so let's just quickly look at the other little pieces here. We discussed the styling. The context menu is extremely simple. It's just that uh, local time sets the clock source to local. Server time sets it to, it actually sets it to NTP, not server, which is a little confusing, but that's just the way I did it. That's simple code, that's simple. The NTP, we'll get into that in a second. The functions here are pretty simple, but I wanted to mention that because here's another thing. I see two people when they code these clocks, how they'll do like their own custom logic where it's like, okay, well the modulo of the time, that'll give us the three. So now we know the PM and that kind of thing. That's a cool way to do it. Perhaps it's more efficient. I'm not sure. 
But another interesting way to do it that has a lot of support is this uh, new in Intel date format, where you can put in a locale, perhaps your locale, if it's English or wherever you happen to be in the world, and you can put in a date format, and there's all these very specific date format options that I've got here. And you can be very specific about exactly what kind of time you want. The numbering system, the calendar system, all these time styles. So you can so it's already built into the browser to be able to format the time any way you want without having to do your own math or roll it yourself. So that's what I've decided to do here. So the time creation function, whenever I once I get a timestamp, like a, a date object. I just do I just do that to get the date string, the day string, and the time string, and then put those strings together so that I can use those strings within the canvas. And uh, just very decla declaratively, I say, like, the date is just a numeric day, a, the long-form version of the month, and the numeric year. So this kind of stuff, it avoids you having to put, like, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, if I have a few for the tooltip. Or, or if, I mean, if we're just focusing on the clock, then you, and, if, and if it's an analog uh, digital clock, then you're talking about the AM, PM, math, if you want to do that. I mean, there, you, can, you can do it that way. I've done it that way in the past. But I like this time format way that, that has pretty good support. So I would also recommend that as well. That's the functions. Quickly, let's get to the NTP thing. I also see another message here from Dark Max. I want to see any advice not to get confused with JavaScript's asynchronous com computation. Um, not particularly, no. I think it's one of those things you just have to do for a long time. I think one thing that happened with me, one job I had to, to learn Erlang programming language, where it's very asynchronous first language, where you can just kind of, with a very basic syntax, that gets sent off into this asynchronous worker, and, and it can be worked, and, and something about that, it just got me more thinking about it that way, where you can, you're just sending things off, and oh, that's there now in my head, you know? And it's like that even with async await and stuff. It's not workers, but you're sending something somewhere and now it's there and it's happening and then and it's coming back and you have to be prepared for it to come back and and you can wait for it or you can have a call back and that kind of thing uh not too relevant to time here but but it's an interesting question nonetheless and yeah it's it's uh, i definitely think about it and it's something to think about with workers too because the worker actually is running separate from the the main thread so it's doing its time calculation and it's just sending this time information uh and it doesn't really know what's going on in the main thread. So in that way, it is asynchronous. Um, yes, the NTP functions. I wanted to get into those quick. They're pretty simple. The base function is just right here, where the first time I check to see if we know how many milliseconds we're ahead by. Now I call it a head by, but it could be a negative number. It could be a positive number. It doesn't really matter, actually. I probably could have worded it in some other generic way, but I did not. I think it actually matters for the fact that I've decided to subtract it. Uh, Probably. No, maybe not. I don't know. But needless to say, it can be negative or positive, presumably. If there is no number here, I have not set it. I set it as zero. Now it's a number. And then I trigger the polling to begin. Uh, and then to finish this function off, I return the that, that information. And it's going to be, this will have been a zero. It wouldn't have had time to update it, probably. Uh, perhaps it will have. Who knows? But it's basically, the first, it's going to send back like zero, probably. Or it'll just send back the, the, the date because it'll be minus zero. But the next time it requests this, this might change because this is a globe this is a uh, a global scoped variable for the instance of the browser is running. This has been re uh, created in the within the NTP module which would be part of the worker because the worker is where this is imported, which we'll get into. So that that number will change as this polling occurs. Now what the polling is doing uh, it gets the request time, so it says, okay, I'm about to do a request to get whatever the NTP server's time is. I'll remember the time I requested it. It does the request, which we'll get into in a second what that is. It's simple enough, just a request, and it gets back those three pieces of information that we've, we saw before. The back off, the now, and, and this is that the piece that wasn't shown there, the opt out. That's something that can occur. There can be an opt out where the NTP server notices that your IP address has requested the time too often. And it says, hey, opt out true, dude. Stop it. And you're supposed to respect that, presumably. And I think if you don't, I don't know, you could get banned, I guess. I'm not sure. So I take that. I, I see we have a now time. I use that to recalculate what the ahead time will be based on the time I requested minus uh, the now time times milliseconds. Yes. I think that the now time is not in milliseconds. It's it's in like, it's like a timestamp that's missing the last... 
couple digits. So that's why I do that multiplication because this timestamp is in milliseconds, I believe. That's the just my justification for multiplying there. And then seal, I just round up because I believe this now number is even like to the decimal point. It's a very accurate number. Uh, so that's just, just to resynchronize this so that next time this runs, this number will be adjusted. And then after I've done the polling, I trigger it again. I say, okay, the next your next timeout to run polling again is based on that logic. So if we got an opt-out, we're going to wait an hour. If we did not get an opt-out, we're just going to base it on the back-off time, which is essentially saying, whoa, 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 don't request again for another 380 seconds or something. And that's why we t uh, multiply by milliseconds so to get that for the timeout. Uh, and then, yeah, the, re the request is, is very basic. It's just using the browser fetch API. I say fetch from the NTP server, which we found from that script and is also mentioned on, the, on that site. And I put my own request options into fetch to make it a, a very generic uh, anonymous request that I, I, it's just the way I like to do it. So I, I remove any reference to the window object here. I say no refer. I set the priority as high so the request is uh, is done as soon as possible. Uh, I do the request over cores because it supports cores. Keep alive. I don't keep that request alive. If it fails, it fails. Just just get done with it. Omit credentials and no caching. So pretty generic request. And and then yeah, we get the JSON response, and then that's what I return here that we we de we destruct there. Uh, so yeah, that's basic enough. That's how the NTP part works. And then let's get to the worker. So the worker has a little bit of magic because it's tricky how to make a canvas. Again, that gets back to where we were talking about the device pixel ratio. Let's do again the control K zero to shrink everything down. And let's look at the logic of the worker here. So everything in a worker is kind of just dumped in there. So you see here, there's just some code here where I, I run a listener. That's just like right on the main part of the module here. This is the key piece. This is where you add a listener for that message that, that I, then in my use worker hook, I've decided the message will be the, the message, I guess. Well, actually, no. Message is, is just a is a, a legitimate event, uh, but I also I think uh, name I think I name the the message type as message, possibly. Uh, so this is the key piece. You get the message. The data comes in, and then we've already kind of looked at a couple of these. So we say when there's an initialization that we do that source request. We already established uh, back here uh, in update time. Those are the two requests. So source. It says, hey, well, what's what source do you want? What source are you going to use? Then I send the source. That comes. That, so that's what I request on initialization. And then over here is where we set it if it happens to come in. And and these conditions, can, any one of these can occur. Like this message gets triggered for every time. So this time it would be for init, and then it would go to the end. This time it would be for this. Uh, and each of the uh, actually for init it does not because there's a return here. So if you are initializing, it stops. Uh, in these cases, it can continue on. So it'll continue all the way to this piece here. Now, what is this piece here? This piece is essentially the next piece that, that just starts the event. It starts the clock, basically. So after initialization has occurred and it, and and the the source response has occurred, so it stops here, doesn't go to this step, but the next time the message is triggered, that's when this stuff's going to occur. And pr this could actually go above that just to be a bit more logical. But essentially, the source is, is men mentioned, is sent, uh, and then there's another, and, and at the same time, I believe it's also, is it at the same time? When is the canvas sent? Yeah, the canvas isn't sent with the source. They're actually sent out of sync. Why is that? I don't think it's relevant, but it's a good question. Let's ignore that for now. There's some reason behind that, but at, at one point it updates the source and another point it updates the canvas. I think the reasoning behind that is that the canvas can change every time. Because anytime you zoom in and change the device pixel ratio, it's gonna have to it recreates the canvas, because that that just worked better with on mobile, for uh, and mobile and desktop I, actually to to be to remake the canvas and scale it at a different pixel ratio. It was just easier to just wipe the slate clean every time, so that's why I think both these events can occur. So sometimes source will update and it'll send it'll start doing the timer. Other times it's gonna redo the whole. Uh, canvas oh no actually sorry i spoke too soon so there's another return in here so both of these are kind of like breakpoints. so if it's initialized it's going to stop here if, it, if it's you're getting the canvas it's going to stop here but if you're getting the source and you've got the canvas and everything presumably uh yeah yeah that's the order that they happen and this happens before this because this is the update time triggering you get the canvas 
you've initialized, you set your source, then you update the clock. Okay. We're clear now, perhaps. So we've t touched on initialization. I just wanted to quickly touch on the canvas. So when, so when the worker gets the canvas uh, as, a, as this data object, it deconstructs the data object to the canvas, the clock size, and that device pixel ratio that gets sent. We store the device pixel ratio within the worker. And within the worker, you can use this global. It's almost like window or self or this kind of. It's another aspect like that. Uh, so we store that, and then if we've got the canvas, if we're, we're updating the canvas as well, we set the canvas here. And these are also uh, global objects that I'm setting global within the scope of that worker. If we get the clock size and pixel ratio, that's when we have to update this. This is for, for updating pixel ratio. This is like a whole other piece you just have to deal with, with the, when you have canvas. It's the same for the wallpapers too. All the wallpaper libraries have to handle device pixel ratio when they're doing these canvases. So we set the size and then we style the clock when when we are, are changing the size. And I'll get to what style clock does as well. It's it's an actually let's just jump right to it because it's an important step. So as we're setting up the clock, we have to style it once we know the height and width. It's part of a canvas. Let's see what style clock does. Uh, this is the, this is basically just the syntax for working with text in a canvas. So here's where we set the scaling to be the device pixel ratio. We set the styling of the text color, the font we want to use, the alignment, positioning, and then again, positioning is relevant to that pixel ratio. This took a while to figure out and to get centered right. Uh, and yeah, th that's the math behind the positioning. And that just assures that this little canvas I'm drawing, no matter what resolution or what pixels per, per dot you happen to have, that it's going to be centered and, and rendered ideally on your screen. Uh, not a super large amount of text, but that's the, that's what re was required for styling the clock, essentially, even simple text. And uh, now let's get to the actual initialization of the clock, because that gets to a point that I've been waiting a while to mention, which was the synchronization. It's another key piece that I, I see people don't do when they make the clock, is that if you just open the page and say, okay, I'm starting the clock, one, two, you kind of forget the point that like you took the time from the system, but the system wasn't at exactly that second and zero milliseconds. So that's why what I do is I actually do two things. I do a timeout and then an interval. I do the timeout where I get the current system time in milliseconds that just gets the milliseconds. So like what millisecond is it right now of the set of the second that's that's currently happening? And at any given time, it's, it'll be like, oh, it's it's at 700 milliseconds, you know? And when it gets to 1,000, then it's back to zero, basically. So I take 1,000 minus whatever it is now, and that's it, it's when that timeout occurs that I start the clock at its second. Uh, on that note, I do do a, a send tick to draw the clock ahead of time. So whatever, the, whatever second it is right now, I do a draw. Because otherwise, if we just do this set timeout, there's going to be the user, when the first opens the page, they might end up waiting, you know, 999 milliseconds to actually see the first second if you didn't draw the second that was the second when they loaded the page. That's why I do several send ticks, which is just the drawing of the canvas, basically. Um, so yeah, that's the basics of that. And then again, and then again, I set up the interval instead of a timeout. And intervals that will be every 1,000 milliseconds, and that's again send tick. And all that sent, and now let's get to what send tick is. Send tick's pretty simple. So it uh, it just gets the current timestamp, the 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 now format time, uh, the date, and we'll get into what that how it does that in a second. Actually, it's, yeah, it's very simple. We can see it right here. So if there's no mode or if it's local, then it just does a straight up new date and just there you go. You got a time. You got a date. Otherwise, it does that get NTP adjusted time, which we've discussed is right here. That's that that NTP time to get the same date the timestamp. So it gets that, it formats it, and we've discussed how to for, how we format it with that new date, date time formatting, and then it posts the message. It sends that off to the back to the front end, the main thread, to be sh to be shown if it's off screen canvas or at least for the date to be used in the tooltip. And then here, if it is off screen canvas, it draws the clock, and finally uh, the drawing of the clock. So if if there's not yet an off screen canvas context, it gets context. This is just something you only need to do once, basically. You need to run get context to get the context when you have a canvas. So I, I just check for it here at the start, but I, I kind of cache it in a variable because you don't need to run get context every single time. 
it's, it's inefficient. And if for some reason I still don't get a context, then I just return because something's messed up. Uh, and then if this is the first time getting context, I run that style clock because uh, the other times are when the height and width change. So that's to draw the clock. And then I just, I get a simple, the square, the, the rectangle of the height and width to be my clock space. And then I fill the text simply. Uh, and that's where I get that, that the time and the position. So there's nothing too fancy to that to just say, put the text there, boom. And, and yeah, that's it. Uh, I happen to have an, an offset here. That's just my little adjustment. You know, the text is here and happens to favor, you know, seven pixels on the top and six on the bottom. And I prefer six on the top and seven on the bottom, that kind of thing. That's just my little offset there. Text position starts at zero and zero until you start getting into these adjustments that happen whenever the pixel ratio changes. Um, but that's about it. That's, that's really, yeah, that's it. So I won't uh, bore anyone anymore. If you like this video, uh, or maybe it's not boring. Hopefully it's not boring to you. So I shouldn't say that, but if you like this video, throw me a like, if you like this kind of content, please subscribe and motivate me, that kind of thing. Uh, I have a lot of other little pieces to my website that I could dive deep into about where I've kind of overthought. you know, there, I don't know why someone needs this much, this much clock on their website, but it's a fun little thing to try. So Feel free to try it yourself and throw some comments in the, in the comment section if you have any other questions. And th otherwise, yeah, thanks for checking out my, my video and uh, I'll see you in the next one.